Religious and sectarian violence is as old as religion itself. Throughout the ages, wars and terrorist actions have been taken ostensibly based upon ideology. Christians, both Catholic against Catholic and Catholic against Protestant, defined Europe. In the Muslim world, Sunnis and Shia waged ruthless campaigns against each other in similar genocidal campaigns across Africa and Asia. But the advent of modern terrorism added a new dimension. In essence, no targets, civilian or holy places were off limits. But on November 20, 1979, a well-organized group of Islamic terrorists attacked the Grand Mosque in Mecca, the holiest site in Islam, killing and wounding hundreds of worshippers and taking hostages, becoming a bloody two-week standoff. But who led the attack? Why did it happen? What was the aftermath? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former history professor, Army and Marine Corps veteran, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. A charismatic 40-year-old preacher called Jaiman al utaybi and another named al utaybi were members of the Salafist group Jama' al Salafiyya al Muhatasiba. Jaiman was the mastermind behind the terrorist attack and often told his personal story that he had been involved in illegal trading, including drug smuggling. However, he had repented, found solace in his religion, and became a zealous and devoted leader. Jehaman himself was rather poorly educated for a religious leader, and he recruited from the rural regions where he found fewer educated people who could be more easily influenced. He had also served as a soldier in the National Guard and had rudimentary training, which he put to good use. Jehaman was keen to go to the isolated and rural areas where Bedouins live, Nasser al Hazimi, a close follower, recalls because his classical Arabic, the language mastered by all scholars of Islam, was weak and he had a strong Bedouin accent, he avoided addressing any educated audience to avoid being exposed. Most of those who knew Juhayman, such as religious student Matwali Saleh, said, Nobody saw this man and didn't like him. He was strange. He had what is called charisma. He was true to his mission, and he gave his whole life to Allah day and night. Eventually, the JSM began to clash with some Saudi clerics, and a crackdown by the authorities ensued, and Jehman fled into the desert, where he wrote a series of pamphlets criticizing the Saudi royal family. He considered the royals to be the cause of society's decadence, allowing men and women to gather in public, not adhering to clothing regulations under Islamic law, and accusing clerics of colluding with it, meaning the royal family, for earthly gains. He became convinced that Saudi Arabia had been corrupted and that only a heavenly intervention could bring salvation. He saw himself as that intervention, possibly even a reincarnation of the Prophet Muhammad, the one who would bring about radical chains, and violence was his answer. His second-in-command, al Taibi, was also angered by Western influence in Saudi society, feeling that non-Islamic infidels were poisoning society and he had been recruiting followers from various nationalities for years under the guise of piety. The members of the JSM lived extremely religious and austere lives, proselytizing, studying the Quran, and adhering to the tenets of Islam as defined by the Saudi religious establishment. Many were radical Wahhabists. He appealed to their religious fervor, and declared a jihad by himself against those who would corrupt the land of the Prophet Muhammad. His planning was meticulous. It was said that hundreds of Muslims had seen him, the new Prophet, in their dreams, and now he was in their midst. There were people speaking of visions of the Mahdi, standing tall in the Grand Mosque and holding the banner of Islam. They believed that the new Mahdi's name was Muhammad bin Abdullah al Qatani. A cleric, who at first was reluctant to accept the identity of the Mahdi, 
but he eventually agreed with the plan. He took on the role of Mahdi and joined Juhayman, a deal that was sealed all the more tightly when Katani's older sister became Juhayman's second wife. Juhayman's followers were convinced, and Matwala Saleh, a member of the JSM, recalls, I remember the last meeting when her brother asked me, Brother Matwali, what do you think about the Mahdi? I said to him, excuse me, please, don't talk about this subject. Then someone said to me, you are a silent devil. Brother, the Mahdi is real, and he is Muhammad bin Abdullah al Katani." Jehaman's followers spent weeks smuggling ammunition and weapons into the mosque, disguised as construction equipment, and especially marked barrels, and placed them in the mosque's basement and minarets, taking advantage of the expansion project underway at that time. His plan was to infiltrate his fighters into the courtyard and enter the mosque and place snipers on high points in the minarets. Thousands of pilgrims were in the area, but that was his objective, mass carnage. This happened in the early hours of November 20th, 1979, as 50,000 Muslims from all over the world gathered in the area immediately around and inside the mosque for dawn prayers in the huge courtyard surrounding the sacred Kaaba in Mecca, Islam's holiest place. A grand total of 100,000 worshippers were on the sprawling mosque grounds that morning surrounding the outer perimeter, half on the inner perimeter who were the closest targets. The Grand Mosque is a vast building consisting mainly of galleries and corridors hundreds of meters long surrounding the Kaaba's courtyard and built on two floors. That was a lot of terrain to cover, but a well-trained defending force had the tactical advantage. Among them mingled 200 men inside the inner courtyard known to be led by Jehaiman el Otebi, but as many as 600 of these terrorists were believed to have been involved. As the Imam finished leading prayers, Jehaiman and his followers pushed him aside and seized the microphone. An audio recording of the speech survives, and Jehaiman can be heard interrupting the speaker from time to time to direct his men to close the shrine's gates and take up sniper positions in its tall minarets, which then dominated the city of Mecca. He called out, Attention brothers, Ahmad al-Lahibi, Go up on the roof. If you see someone resisting at the gates, shoot them. The terrorists then began taking their positions. According to an anonymous witness, Jehaman was the first to pay homage to the Mahdi, and immediately others started following his example. Cries of, God is great, rang out. According to one pilgrim, Abdel Manam Sultan, an Egyptian religious student who knew some of Jehaman's followers, recalls that the Grand Mosque was full of foreign visitors, who spoke little Arabic and did not know what was happening. The terrorists had placed coffins in the center of the yard, a traditional act of seeking blessings for the recently deceased, which would not have aroused suspicion. But when the coffins were opened, they contained handguns and rifles, which were quickly distributed amongst the men. The sight of armed gunmen in a space in which the Quran strictly forbids any violence and no weapons and hearing gunshots also stunned many worshippers who tried to escape to reach any remaining exits. But in just an hour, the audacious takeover was complete. The armed group was now in full control of the Grand Mosque, mounting a direct challenge to the authority of the Saudi royal family. Soon after the gates were chained shut, the snipers took positions in the high minarets and shot innocent worshippers. Al Qatibi's followers, who had taken positions in the minarets, shot at bystanders and Saudi special forces if they came too close to the mosque's grounds. The Saudi leadership was very slow to react to the attack on the Grand Mosque. In fact, Crown Prince Fahd bin Abdulaziz Al Saud was in Tunisia at the Arab League summit, and Prince Abdullah, head of the National Guard that protected royal leaders, was in Morocco. Responsibility fell upon the old and unwell King Khaled and Defense Minister Prince Sultan to coordinate a response. Reconnaissance photos taken above the mosque and surrounding grounds from the Royal Saudi Arabian Air Force fighters showed the floor surrounding the Kaaba empty of worshippers, an image never witnessed before. Initially, the Saudi police failed to understand the scale of the problem, sending two patrol cars to investigate. But as they drove up to the Grand Mosque, they came under a hail of bullets. A security cordon was established around the Grand Mosque, and special forces, paratroopers, and armored units were called in. 
According to the BBC, Mark Hambly, a political officer at the U.S. Embassy in Jeddah, and one of the few Westerners who were aware of the situation, said this assault was brave but naive. To quote him, they were immediately shot down. The sharpshooters had very good weapons, very good caliber Belgian rifles. A religious student named Abdel Manaim Sultan, who was trapped inside, said clashes intensified from afternoon on the second day. I saw artillery fire directed towards the minarets, and I saw helicopters hovering constantly in the air, and I also saw military airplanes. During the next two days, the Saudi units launched frontal assaults in an effort to gain entrance, but the terrorists were able to repel several waves of attacks, despite them being heavily outgunned and outnumbered. They burned car tires and rugs, making a thick smoke screen, covering the cellar areas with weapons every time the military and police tried to enter the perimeter. They had a clear killing ground. al Atabi and Juhayman had committed an atrocity in the name of religion when they seized the Grand Mosque, and they had to know that they were on borrowed time when engaged in combat with Saudi Special Forces. The siege increased in momentum. This was a man-to-man -man confrontation within a limited space, said Major Mohammed al Nufai, the commander of the Ministry of Interior Special Forces. A combat situation with bullets whizzing by left and right is somewhat unbelievable. Jehayman was then told that the Mahdi, Mohammed bin Abdullah al Qatani, was wounded, but he told his followers, do not believe them, they are deserters. A fatwa issued by the kingdom's main clerics, assembled by King Khaled, cleared the Saudi military to use any degree of force necessary to repel the rebels. Anti-tank guided missiles and heavy guns were then employed to dislodge the rebels from the minarets, and armored personnel carriers were sent in to breach the gates. The terrorists were galvanized by the Mahdi. I saw him with two minor injuries under his eyes and his taub. His dress was riddled with holes from gunshots, said Abdel Manaim Sultan. He believed that he could expose himself anywhere out of conviction that he was immortal. He was the Mahdi, after all. But Katani's belief in his own invulnerability was unfounded, and he was soon struck by gunfire. The siege shocked Saudi society, which had been living a normal life and whose country was transformed from a desert nation to a sophisticated state. It was the main story all over the Muslim world. On the sixth day, the Saudi forces took control of the courtyard and the buildings surrounding it, forcing the terrorists to retreat into a labyrinth of hundreds of rooms and cells underneath, convinced by Juhayman that the Mahdi was still alive somewhere in the building. But their situation was now dire. The smells surrounding us from the dead or the injuries that had rotted, says an anonymous witness, in the beginning, water was available, but later on they started to ration supplies. Then the dates ran out, so they started eating balls of raw dough. It was a terrifying atmosphere. It was like you were in a horror movie. But the Saudis needed help to capture the leaders alive and put an end to the siege. They turned to French President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. In essence, they were in way over their heads. Our ambassador told me that it was obvious the Saudi forces were very disorganized and didn't know how to react, Giscard d'Estaing told the BBC, confirming for the first time France's role in the crisis. France responded and sent three advisors from the recently formed counter-terror unit, GIGN. The operation had to remain secret to avoid any criticism of Western intervention in the birthplace of Islam. The French team was stationed in a hotel in nearby Taif, where they created plans to fill the basement with gas, rendering the air unbreathable. This would then force the terrorists to surrender or die in place, limiting further friendly casualties. Holes were dug every 50 meters in order to reach the basement, says Captain Paul Baril, who was in charge of executing the operation. Gas was injected through these holes. The gas was dispersed with the help of grenade explosions into every corner where the rebels were hiding. For the anonymous witness who spoke with BBC, holed up down in the basement with the last of the resisting rebels, the world seemed to be coming to an end. As stated, 
The feeling was as though death had come to us because you didn't know whether this was the sound of digging or of a rifle. It was a terrifying situation. The French punched holes in the floor as well, and Jehaman ran out of ammunition and food in the last two days, said Nasser al Hazaimi, one of his followers. They were gathered in a small room, and the soldiers were throwing smoke bombs on them through a hole they made in the ceiling. That's why they surrendered. Jehaman left, and all of them followed. Sixty-eight terrorists survived, but one reportedly died of wounds. Military casualties were 127 dead and 451 injured. Officially, 255 pilgrims, troops, and fanatics killed and another 560 injured, although diplomats and other experts suggested the toll was much higher. The actual death toll has never been released. Major Nufai witnessed the meeting that followed between the Saudi princes and Juhayman after his capture. Prince Saud al-Faisal asked him, Why, Juhayman? Juhayman answered, It's only fate. He was asked, Do you need anything? He just said, I want some water. The charges against the terrorists were violating the Masjid al-Haram's, the Grand Mosque's sanctity, violating the sanctity of the month of Muharram, killing fellow Muslims and others, disobeying legitimate authorities, suspending prayer at Masjid al-Haram, erring in identifying the actual Mahdi, exploiting the innocent for criminal acts. Juhayman himself was paraded before the cameras, and just over a month later, 63 of the remaining rebels were publicly executed in eight cities across Saudi Arabia. Juhayman was the first to die. On January 9, 1980, a well-known news presenter Hussein Najjar then announced al katabis execution. All were beheaded. Public executions of the perceived devoted had a great impression upon one Saudi, a man named Osama bin Laden. He would establish his religious fanaticism in later years. Juhayman's action stopped all modernization, Nasser al Husami says. Let me give you a simple example. One of the things he demanded from the Saudi government was the removal of female presenters from TV. After the Haram incident, no female presenter appeared on TV again. King Khalid then decided that more religion was needed to quell the population, so Saudi Arabia then adopted an ultra-conservative path up to the present, and only recently have things slowly started to change. The attack has become buried history in Saudi Arabia, but it is still in the collective minds of Saudi citizens. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman reflected upon the event and how it changed Saudi society in his first American TV interview on 60 Minutes. In order to bring Saudi Arabia within the sphere of modern nations, he has vowed to bring back the kingdom's pre-1979 moderation. He states, we were living a very normal life like the rest of the Gulf countries. Women were driving cars. There were movie theaters in Saudi Arabia. Women worked everywhere. We were just normal people developing like any other country in the world until the events of 1979. Perhaps one day, Islamic society, especially in Saudi Arabia, will return to a more westernized social society, but that day may be long in coming. Thank you for watching this episode of Forgotten History. If you liked what you saw, please click like, share, and subscribe. And if you would like to assist with the ever-increasing cost of production, please consider becoming a channel member and joining our Patreon page. Please check out our merchandise store. And thanks for watching.